All right. Christian, how are we doing, my man? Pretty good. Not too bad. So, all right, everybody, this is episode 19 of The Art of Mindful Medicine. I really appreciate you all coming here and taking um, this time on, uh, on your Thursday to, uh, to join Dr. Christian Gonzalez and myself. And again, I am the host of this show, The Art of Mindful Medicine, Dr. Seth Gilson. I am a biological dentist, certified yoga teacher, speaker, and personal coach. And like I was saying, my very special guest today is Dr. Christian Gonzalez. So a little bit about Dr. Gonzalez before we get started. Christian completed his Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine at the University of Bridgeport College of Naturopathic Medicine in 2014. As part of his training, Christian completed clinical rotations in pediatrics, general medicine, oncology, physical medicine, botanical, and mind-body medicine, along with a preceptorship at the NYU Langone Integrative Urology Center. He completed a two-year residency position at the Competitive Cancer Treatment Centers of America in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. There, he became proficient in integrative oncology through exposure to various disciplines and modalities. Dr. Gonzalez's rare balance of focus and bedside manner during his residency led him to having long-lasting effects on the patients he treated physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Dr. Gonzalez applies the belief that the body has an innate ability to heal itself when given favorable conditions to thrive. He works in finding the root cause of imbalances and and giving the body what it needs to heal while removing obstacles to restoring health. Currently, Dr. Gonzalez is not seeing patients and is focusing his energy on mass education. Dr. Gonzalez is currently the host of a weekly podcast called Heal Thyself, which features some of the top voices in the health profession and surpassed 1 million downloads in its first year. He has been featured in many of the top health wellness podcasts and national media where he teaches about breast cancer prevention, toxins in your home, and the power of rituals. Dr. Gonzalez enjoys yoga, meditation, dancing, and songwriting, which is why I think he and I will get along quite well. And uh, Dr. Gonzalez, thank you again for so much. I really appreciate you uh, taking your time and, and, and energy and coming on here to share with all of us. And I always like to start with gratitude. So if you could please share three things that you are grateful with us, uh, grateful for with us today, please. Um, I already did my gratitudes this morning. <laughs> awesome. One of them was a big gratitude towards my big toe. And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying like, <laughs> the, the, fact, the fact that it can keep me in balance, the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, if I if I drop something on the floor, I can utilize that like a uh, to like a gripper. But I'm really happy that I have my big toe. And mm-hmm. I, I was I was I you know usually speak to people about being grateful for the things that you overlook so much and how much of us overlook our big toe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm also grateful that I'm able to sit out here in a short sleeve shirt at 11:42 uh, in the afternoon in the middle of what we're in November already. Mm-hmm. So that's re- that's really beautiful. Um, and that I can be surrounded with nature. I have a sequoia tree here, but I have a palm tree right there. So it's, it's really beautiful stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really like that. I think um, pointing out the things that um, people tend to overlook are, are really the small things that are really worth being grateful for. So mm-hmm. I, I actually can really appreciate that. And um, I think that's something that people really should take note of because, of course, it's funny when you first hear it, but it's, it's also there, there's meaning behind that and, that. and that meaning is very valuable. So mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so Christian, please t- tell us a little bit about you, uh, your personal story. Tell us a little bit about your personal life growing up. Um, well, I, I grew up, um, in New York for a little bit, my childhood, and then I moved to New Jersey. Um, most of my life, at least, you know, in the early nineties, there was no, there was no tidal wave of health like there is now for the generations <laughs> that we see. So of course I grew up like every other kid my age and I was eating Dunkaroos and Gushers for lunch. Um, you know, I, my, my parents definitely did their best to, to provide a healthy diet, but really, uh, because, because you and I are of the same frequency, I know you can appreciate throughout my life. I've always been drawn to, uh, healing and helping, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what capacity, I don't know. I didn't even know it till after I graduated college. But the healing and helping and the attraction to that and knowing that, you know, I I, I was able to help people feel comfortable and at peace um, in that capacity, like helping them heal. You know, I was always someone that people looked to when I was young for advice, you know. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'd be a psychiatrist, but I ended up going to dental school instead. Um, I remember you said that. That was really interesting. Yeah, because of my own experience with um, 
with my development of my teeth and um, the confidence issues that I had in high school and uh, mm -hmm. early college with my teeth. So uh, going to dental school, I thought that it would be nice to carry on that trauma and heal it and then help children, you know, be confident with their teeth. So I wanted to be an orthodontist. And then throughout that time and I know that many people who have joined have heard the story that my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was in school and you know one thing led to another and uh, I ended up not being in dental school and moving to naturopathic school because that that learning about what naturopathic medicine completely ignited a fire within me that you know actually was the was a catalyst for getting this tattoo that says mm -hmm. intuition mm -hmm. because because it was that listening of something that was within that said you need to be here right now, learning this right now. Why? I have no idea. Where I'm going to go, I have no idea. So <laughs> the fact that I had the, my first true palpable feeling of intuition happened, that was what changed my life. And then, you know, four years later, I graduate school. Two years later, I've graduated residency. I come to California. And then that intuition comes again. They told me, I get out of clinic. Get out of five days of work clinic and, you know, start teaching people what you feel, what you learn, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is the important thing that I always tell people, like, you have to understand what your gifts are. You know, yeah. I, I, I know since I was young, I've been good with people. I've been able to have a conversation with one person or 100 people. Mm -hmm. I know that I preferred to speak to 100 people versus <laughs> one person. So, you know, being in clinic, you're one on one and it's awesome. You can build a deep rapport with one person. But to me, I'm like, I feel like I'm better at talking to hundreds and thousands. So. Again, intuition, I followed that and made the shift into this. And of course, you make a shift where you're supposed to be and you're gifted and blessed with, you know, a breaking of a dam and a giant tidal wave of all this beautiful stuff that's been waiting for you. And I think that that's what's becoming realized right now. Awesome. That, that's beautiful. I, I can I can definitely relate to um, intuition and, and, and how just trusting that, that inner inner voice you have. And mm -hmm. clearly, it, it's certainly served you well. Um, so, so I commend you on, on having the strength to, to do so because not everybody does. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so mo moving on from that, so I'm going to go back a little bit more toward, towards your childhood again. What, what would you say is the most impactful memory you have from your childhood? Oh, impactful memory. Um, God, I think, I think that I had a really, really good childhood and um, I grew up in a household which was, which celebrated music and, and liveliness, you know, Beautiful. Um, particularly my mother, who was such a huge fan of salsa music. I don't know if you ever heard salsa music, but oh yeah, <laughs> you can't not move. If you listen, you can't. <laughs> first of all, salsa music is the worst music to listen to before bed because you'll oh, be yeah. ready to go. <laughs> so you got to understand, like, this is the environment I grew up in. So I think it wasn't a one particular memory. It was just the accumulation of understanding that, that was my normal to be happy and celebrating and radiating, yeah. you know, and wanting to share that, you know, mood with people. So that's really stuck with me for quite a while because I think that the vibration of growing up in a household that plays that type of music never goes away. Like I always yeah. want people to feel uplifted, happy, vibing, you know, ready to just like break out in song, break out in dance, break out in laughter. And, uh, I, I think that that would be the best memory because I've woken up many days to salsa music, you know, yeah, no, from absolutely. my childhood to college. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that's a beautiful thing to, to have grown up with. I mean, that, that definitely plays a role in, 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 in kind of ingrained itself in all the things that you do. I mean, because you're, you're clearly very lively and I, and I think that that's kind of invested mm -hmm. itself w within you and, and, that, and your actions and, and how you do things. So that, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's the point I'm trying to make. Like, there's such a huge influence in the way you grow up and the way it translates to, to you. Look, look, my brother grew up in the same household. His personality is different than mine, mm -hmm. but it just so happened that my personality hit with that lively nature and lively yeah. household that, that it's just, that's what I, that's what I want to give people. Yeah. Right, Cause when we're born, we're born with kind of like a, a, a neural network and then, and then how we perceive that, that network and those experiences is going to like, we're going to branch off in, in different ways. That's why we're all different. And that's why perspective mm -hmm. is so important. Mm -hmm. um, so what's a pivotal moment in your life that's helped shape you into the person you are today as, as you got older? What would you say? Mm -hmm. I think that uh, when I was in college, you see, I heard the word potential so much when I was in elementary school and high school. <laughs> um, 
I can relate. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, yeah, and great. And you're, you're, you know, you're a successful dentist. Like, it, I know what dental school is like. It's very difficult. I did two years of it, so <laughs> I, I applaud you because. But look, like, what I can look back and reflect on is that elementary, just the, the institution of teaching was not my vibe. I didn't like sitting down and being spoken to, mm -hmm. author authoritatively, and then have to listen and learn that way. It's not the way I learn. Yeah. I, when I when I came into a place and said I learn better if I draw pictures on a chalkboard or on my paper, then I can remember what it looks like because that's the type of visual learner I am. So I think that it's unfortunate because the institution or the the education system really pinholes a lot of these folks. So I think that through most of my life I went through potential. That that was like progress reports and you know parent teacher conferences. Your son has so much potential. I just didn't like it. So. When it came to college, I didn't do that well in the first few years because I just didn't know how to study biology, study organic chemistry, study chemistry. A pivotal moment was when I met my mentor at Rutgers University and he took me in into this, into his office and it was a program of minority students to have support and success in the sciences. And even within the context of auditory listening and, te and learning, I was taught the tools, how to create more discipline in my life, mm -hmm. and that never left. So the whole point I'm trying to make is like, sometimes you have to be humble enough to think that you, you ain't going to do everything and know mm -hmm. that there's a mentor out there who's been through it and is ready to teach you ways within your context of how you learn. And uh, his name is Dr. Dr. Khan in, at Rutgers University, and he has since graduated massive amounts of dental students and doctors coming out of Rutgers, all minority association. So um, he's put a lot of minorities and underprivileged youths right through college, uh, helping put them right through college, right into medical school. So it's unbelievable. That's beautiful. the work that he's done. He, yeah, he, he needs like a, a, a front and center Time Magazine <laughs> cover, but it's, he's an incredible person. But For that, sure. that's pivotal. Find yourself a mentor. Humble yourself. Find yourself yeah. a mentor who can truly, truly help you and who's been through it all. And um, yeah, that was that was huge in, in the success. Yeah, I, I think, like you said, that being humble and, and being willing to ask for help because we're, we're, we're not meant to really go through all of this alone and nobody has all the answers. So I, mm -hmm. I think building that community, whether it's just with one person like a mentor or a, a group of people that you surround yourself with to, to give that support and and knowledge that you and experience that you just don't necessarily have yet is extremely, extremely important just throughout life in general, whether it's getting into a medical program or through a medical program mm -hmm. or, or, or ha having a family, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. So th yeah. That, that's beautiful to know. And somebody's commenting. All I really know is that we don't know anything. And it, it's more true as I get older, because I promise you, when I was in college, I thought I knew it all about life, <laughs> about school, you know, about myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but the but the fact of the matter is, is that life is a it just constantly unfolds. You never hit something. You just once you think you hit something, it's like, oh, here's more about yourself. Here's more about people, and here's more about how the world works. Exactly, it's just reaching another layer, yeah. and and there's and there's endless and infinite amount of layers, and um, that that that's the kind of the the game we play, I, I guess, and, and it and it's fantastic, and that that's it's rewarding too. I mean, that that's kind of. I feel like that's part of the meaning of life to, to find that meaning and to take on that responsibility at, at that new level each, each time that you get there. Um, mm -hmm. And it's part of all of our process. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, so, I mean, I understand what, what kind of inspired you to get into naturopathic medicine. You, you were following your intuition and things. Um, but what was that journey like in school for you? I mean, especially with you said what, everything would happen with your mother and things like yeah. that. So how, what was yeah. that like? It's a good question, uh, and, and it may be helpful for many folks who are considering a program, which can be potentially rigorous or long. Um, for them, it, it was it was kind of difficult, to be honest. In the first year um, was when uh, my mom was going really downhill, and she passed away during finals week of the first year. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was on paper very, very difficult because of the extenuating circumstances, but... Um, I, again, like I go back to back in Rutgers through my mentor, like I created the discipline of learning how to go through these science courses in, in the middle of college that I transferred that to dental school. And then th that same discipline came to naturopathic school. So for me, the harder thing was dealing with the death of my mom through the first two years of course. Than, than school because 
the discipline was there. Like, you know, I was in the hospital bedroom studying, you mm-hmm. know, so that, that wasn't a problem, but, um, yeah, like, like school was very interesting. Cause you know, the, the, after she passed away, it was like just all school. And, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it was, I knew I was in the right place because I wanted, I was excited to go to class, even though, again, I was auditory, auditorily learning. Mm-hmm. I was still excited to go to class and draw pictures based on what I was learning. Mm-hmm. So I would sit in class and they'd be telling me something, but I'd be drawing the picture. So I, I think a lot of teachers thought I was doodling in the back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I really wasn't. I was just trying to learn. But uh, I, I sort of made naturopathic school like my thing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, Which I was, is exactly how it should be. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm a visual learner, more visual as well. So, I mean, I yeah. can com- completely relate to that. Yeah. So, I mean, but it was very much so rewarding because I knew, like, let's say, for example, I was learning about botanical medicine. I was like, holy shit, like all all of these medications are based on an analog that is coming from nature. (laughs) I had no idea. And I was like, wait a minute, you mean to tell me I can give white willow bark instead of aspirin to a patient and it's safer and and, and it's just as powerful, you know, Mm -hmm. like and like I had so many of those realizations through school and i was like this is powerful powerful medicine because then i saw the institution of what we're doing and we're just treating symptoms and then i see people in clinic years three and four who are having reversal of symptoms that are not supposed to be reversed you know simply by just going over what their lifestyle is what their mental emotional is how deeply connected they are to spiritual and what their damn diet is mm-hmm. like literally just going over that and people are completely reversing symptoms and diseases that are not supposed to be diseased in a small little clinic in the middle of bridgeport connecticut is yeah, wild yeah. no that's beautiful um yeah and and the, the healing process for you i mean th- this must have i mean healing is different for everybody right and, and going through something like that I and mean, like you said even though you you enjoyed and wanted to be in school i mean i can only imagine uh, what that must have felt like to to have to go through the healing process while being in such an intense program and, and that requires so much time, energy, and focus. Um, so, I mean, my t- my hat's off to you for that, my man. I completely. Uh, I'll I'll say this caveat: I didn't heal. I I went through. I the the trauma happened. I put it mm-hmm. under the rug. Uh, that, and and that's I, where I was going to get to. Yeah. Okay. I let school be the outlet for of distraction, mm-hmm. right? And then I let other things socially be an outlet for distraction you know so i i I became a master of distracting myself after school you know in my residency even coming to california up till even last year i became a master of attracting myself with different distractions or distracting myself um until really this year until i move over here to the mountains and i'm all alone i can't distract myself because my closest friend is 30 minutes away so that solitude really created space for healing and facing what should, what could have been faced a while ago but this is what i tell mm-hmm. people because my friend my friend god my friend my one of my close friends here his mom tragically died in a car accident two months ago or a month and a half ago and i told him the importance of of grieving that process now because we as men are one are not taught correctly how to grieve two the toxic masculinity that we have is teaching us all right you put it to the side you know, let's, let's get, let's get it done. Let's go to work. Yep. Let's, let's provide for the family. We got to be the face of, you know, strength. Any mm-hmm. vulnerability is to the side and shit like, you know, a, a machismo Latin masculine man. That's very easy for me. I had, I had the perfect <laughs> storm to do that. Yep. Know? Yep. But the fact of the matter is, is that 11 years later, I allowed that space for grief. I allowed myself to face what I needed to face. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I, it, I say this, this is the craziest thing. I cried maybe three, four times in 11 years or 10 years. <laughs> it, like in, in 10, 11 years, wild. But then moving here in solitude, it was like 39 days straight, every single day crying, every single day. And I, at the, in the beginning, I was like, oh, this is, this is due to something else. But then I was like, oh, no, this is, some, this is shit I've been holding in for so long. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that we need to allow ourselves, whether male or female, to truly, truly feel the pain, trauma, sit with it, and understand what our distractions are. It's okay to distract, right? It's okay to put on Netflix. It's okay to go to work. It's okay to go out with friends. It's okay to party. But really see that from a bird's eye view and go, am I distracting myself? Yeah. Maybe I can sit today with some pain. Maybe I, can, maybe I could just sit, like the visual I had was I was on a bench and I was sitting next to grief. It was a big purple monster. And we weren't talking. I just sat in this visual in my head next to grief on a bench because really grief and loneliness, all it wants is company. So over here, I'm yeah. sitting with a visual and we're just hanging out and I'm sitting on my couch and, you know, the emotions come up. But um, 
yeah, it's a beautiful thing once we let ourselves be the people that we truly are here to meant to be, and it, re it requires a lot of trauma to come up. Yeah, Peel peeling off the masks and um, and really sitting with our, our feelings and feeling the the emotions that that come up is really important. And like you said, there for between the toxic mas masculinity and not not having the support um, that's needed and not being taught how to go through these processes is. Um, is really important and, and um, right. just like you, you described, I mean, it took you 11 years to, to reach that point. Um, so thank you for sharing that. That's a, that's a mm. beautiful, and very impactful uh, story for a lot of people because I don't think a lot of men realize that it's okay to cry. It's okay mm. to feel and, and it's okay to, to express it to others around you. Yeah. So, yeah, the ego is very powerful, man. And like, I just put up a story and one of the last things I said on my story was that I, I, if I know anything that no one, no one can tell me differently, I know that people, everyone just wants to be loved, including men, including the hardest shelled, egoic, brick wall <laughs> men under there is just a child that needs love, Yep, you know, and wants to ask for help. And, you know, I see that. I see that through like different ceremonies that I'll, I'll go through. I'll see like the hardest men that wall come up and you see such a beautiful person behind that wall mm -hmm. it's true and you literally see yourself right you see the yeah. beauty within you and someone else and you're like that that's all ego that's all stuff that we've learned that's all protective mechanisms stories and concepts that we've built throughout life to mm -hmm. protect ourselves from trauma when in third grade somebody said this about your capacity or ability we block that and then it, it stays with us for so long but shit when that stuff comes up and you see authentically a man or a woman and who they truly are it yeah. is the most it is absolutely one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. A hundred percent. I couldn't, I could not agree with you more. I mean, that, that raw authenticity that, that comes through. I mean, that's, that's the most real that it can get. Absolutely. So, um, so throughout all of this, uh, when did spirituality actually come into your life? Back in college. So before all of this, I would say in around 2007, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I spoke about this a few times, but um, I read this book called Conversations with God. And, um, you know, I grew up Christian, um, but at that point, it answered many deeper questions than Christianity would answer. Um, and again, I'm tolerant of everything as long as it's not hurting anyone and it's inclusive, mm -hmm. you know, that, that's that. But, but for me, in that point, it shifted towards a broader perspective of who I am spiritually. What's my connection to myself? Who am I? And yeah, someone, it's a, that book changed my life. So that person yeah. read the same thing, but yeah, but yeah, like. Who am I to myself? Who am I to others? And who am I to the world? And it completely shifted. And that was actually, remember I told you I got intuition tattooed? Mm -hmm. Two years before I got this tattoo, that was my first intuition. I didn't know what it was, but it's literally like I took a shot of energetic tequila because <laughs> I went from reading a book, reading these words, the words integrating, speaking so much deep truth to me that I got literally buzzed from mm -hmm. reading and I go, how is this possible that a book is making me <laughs> drunk? <laughs> but it's, but what was happening was a full alignment of, of me, right? Everything yeah. was flowing. And in that moment, it's called conversations with God. Um, yeah. Someone asked, but yeah, it was, it's three parts and it's, it's, it's a beautiful book. And the thing is, it's like, I was reading it and I was like, all right, what if this is made up? It doesn't matter if it's made up. Does it resonate with you? Exactly. It sure as hell resonated with me. <laughs> you can read it. Doesn't resonate. It's not your truth, but you better believe that was my truth at that moment, and it completely changed the way I saw things. That created the snowball of like looking into consciousness, looking into yoga, looking into meditation, looking into quantum physics. The whole thing just happened, and from 20, 2007 on, it's just been like this is the way I saw the world, and now it's like that. Yeah. You know, it's just awesome. had never never been the same. Awesome. So what, what would you say, if you had to um, define it, what, what does mindfulness mean to you? The hyper-presence, completely being in a state of you, completely being in a state of now moment, um, in a state of reality, like mm -hmm. being, being truly alive. Because when you're projecting to the future, when you're going back to the past, you ain't living, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you're in the hyper-present now moment state, like... I'm talking to you and you're the only person that exists, even though there's a bunch of comments, like I'm focused yeah. on this conversation, not thinking about where I have to be in an hour. Yeah. That's, that's mindfulness. And if we can live our life like that, then I, I personally don't believe disease can exist in a state of true, deep, consistent mindfulness. Absolutely. I, I, 
I completely agree. Very well said. Um, and what are some of the ways that you incorporate mindfulness in your personal life and relationships? Mm, that's a good one because I absolutely can can integrate more mindfulness every single day. I, I mean, like I preach it, but it's not like I live at 100% either. Mm-hmm. The re- the, what, what really helps is doing the rituals every day and mm-hmm. taking, they, taking the time out like I did them this morning. I didn't have enough time that, to do like a three-hour ritual, so I did like 20-minute ritual. But mm-hmm. guess, what I, guess what I did? I put my feet on the ground and every single footstep that I felt, every single rock, every piece of dirt, every pine needle, I felt, you know, like being focused on just my feet. And then that's where I got my big toe gra- gratitude from. Yeah. I, was look- <laughs> I was looking at my big toe. I was like, well, I'd probably topple over if I didn't have this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but truly, truly. And, and you know, for folks, it's, a, it's a, a little bit harder. But like what I say is like go outside and listen, smell, hear, you know, hear, look around use your senses to fully be immersed in your experience and uh and then you'll you'll learn what mindfulness is absolutely i absolutely um i I think that having the those rituals as you call them um are extremely important uh on a on a regular basis if not every single day um Mm -hmm. and but not all like just like you said not being stuck to it doesn't have to be three hours if whatever whatever form of meditation you choose if if that can only be five or 10 minutes instead of 20 or 30 minutes, let it be. But um, con- continue pr- using those practices to facilitate that, that mindfulness in your life. And um, like you said, it, it, continuously doing that will, you will eventually ideally reach an, um, a disease-free state once we can, can live in that space. This, the, best, the best meal I've ever eaten was an apple on a bus to New York City. I was going to Port Authority and I sat there and my phone died. And I'm, I'm just, I'm like, what am I going to do? I was like, I don't have nothing to write on. I have no magazine. And I was like, let me eat this apple and truly use all of my senses. Let me chew till it's like mush completely. And let me just meditate and eat this apple. It was the best meal I've ever had in my life. <laughs> how's, it po- how's it possible that, that an apple, but you understand what I'm saying. When you're truly mindful, yeah. it is like the most blissful, exquisite, delicious life you can have because 100%. you're literally not just eating, but like you're experiencing life through that now moment. Yeah. You're, you're experiencing flavors that you, in a different way that you've never really experienced them before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so shifting a little bit, but staying on top on mindfulness, what's been your experience with, and do you feel mindfulness is being practiced in medicine? No, no, not, I mean, maybe integratively, Certainly through naturopathic medicine, I think we, we do a really good job of trying to integrate mind-body connection. Mm-hmm. But if you think about the conventional ma- model of medicine, there's no mindfulness, you know, mm-hmm. like maybe, maybe do some yoga. I mean, I worked in an integrative cancer hospital and we did recommend yoga because of the data of what yoga does for women after breast surgery or, or after uh, traditional uh, chemotherapy or radiation. But th- we, we're not, it's not, it's not part of what is done in medicine, which ironically, as I mentioned before, I don't believe that disease can truly exist in a consistently every single day mindful state. Yeah. So it's the most ironic thing that we're not recommending something that literally can be curative for, for somebody. And I'm not going to say that it will cure everything. You know, I don't want to put that of out course. there. Yeah. I can't. But I will say that like, it's worth trying to live your life mindfully and see how you feel about autoimmune disease or your joint pain or your gastric issues, you know? See if they resolve when you're more in the now moment. Yeah, I mean, it literally can't hurt. So <laughs> the, the, the worst thing that can happen is you stay the same. Yeah, and, it doesn't hurt. It actually feels uh, good. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so what are some of the ways that, that you've experienced or, or seen that mindfulness overlaps with health? What are, what are some of the things you've witnessed it, through integrative medicine, things that, they, like you said, you've practiced? Uh, well, like for me personally, states of mindfulness, um, I can get a nervous stomach, like, right. Like if I'm on the go, like my stomach, I'm not hungry. I just don't eat for like a full day. Um, but taking that time on the go to like close my eyes in the car, breathe for like 12 seconds, 13 seconds really resets a lot. Like in those very moments, I know that my mind through my vagus nerve is activating my sympathetic nervous system. You know, I know it's going like that, or I know my sympathetic is activated, but I know through the breath work, the the vagus nerve is activated to relax it. So Mm -hmm. it's interesting because when you know the physiology behind it, you know what's happening in your body. But that, 
what I'm trying to say is that mindful state completely took away the discomfort or the dis-ease that I was living with in that day. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting because like I'm, what I tell people is like, see if you're still fully bloated. See if you, see if you still have full, full heartburn. See if, you're, if you have that pain truly when you're deep in meditation. Yeah. Right. Or you're deep into a yoga flow, you know, like when you're truly just or you're deep into eating an apple. See if like that stuff st has room to start creeping into your reality or if it's in the periphery and you're really just experiencing life. Yeah. And, and that, that really is like yoga, uh, mm -hmm. essentially um, be, being in that state. Um, that, that is what yoga means, that union, that connection. So mm -hmm. um, that is yoga. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Again, now shifting from mindfulness a little bit to, into what you're doing now, um, what, what exactly is the focus and the work that you're doing right now? The focus of the work is mass education. Mm -hmm. how, ca how can we empower people as fast as possible to make changes to their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual? And we do that through different platforms, through teaching. Um, and the goal is, is hundreds of millions of people. Not, not like, okay, like we, what we've reached probably now just through the podcast, uh, close to 2 million already. Mm -hmm. That's not to say through the life of Instagram, how many have been reached, let's say on average, maybe 30,000 per post uh, mm -hmm. on, with insights. So you see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. yeah, there's overlap with the same people, but the culmination is, is bigger. And of course, and I would, yeah. And, yeah. And I always tell people, listen, I just want to be a medium, like put me under the radar. I don't, I don't need to be seen, heard, like, shit, I'm okay. I don't need any validation from anyone. <laughs> what, what, I, what I know is what I'm here to do, right? What I know is deep, deep my mission in this life. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what I'm doing. So if we can reach millions and millions of people, then perfect, let's do it, you know? It, because what happens is I'll tell one person something, they'll tell their mom and dad. The mom and dad will be at work or a barbecue, and then they'll tell someone else they care about. You see, like, that logarithmic expansion of empower, empowering and education through consciousness, but also just physical health, you know, on the surface, mm -hmm. that, that's massive. What the world would be, what the world would be if all of a sudden everyone became mindful, learned how to shop, learned how to eat, right, learned how to breathe, learned how to love each other, just in, in, in one day, imagine. the whole world would change. The, in one day. Just imagine, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to, just like the song. <laughs> I mean, John, yeah. John Lennon really, it really had it right when he when he wrote that. Um, so, yeah, but, John, and, but John, John Lennon did not have the connection that we can, that we do. We can literally talk yeah. to someone in Bulgaria, exactly. empower them yeah. to completely make a massive change to their whole community. 100%. That's wild. Yeah, and and it's funny. It's um, you, that you're, you're you're talking about like that that inspiration, that that intuition that's kind of led you to this point to to what your purpose is. Um, at the beginning of, of this year, once um, the pandemic and everything started, is kind of when one day I just kind of had this this thrust in in the, in the same kind of way, um, which is what was the, the inspiration for this show and, and connecting with people just like yourself that, that do things just like you do and reach out to others and to, to help connect you with more people. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I, I, I honestly know that what you're doing is beautiful. And, and again, I just want to thank you for for doing the things that you do. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so in your studies of oncology, what, what would you say are some of the greatest takeaways from those experiences? Um, that the conventional model of cancer does not properly follow through with cancer. Um, I think that we miss a huge boat when it comes to what was the root cause of the cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so the model that we have is to treat the symptoms. So the symptom being the tumor, we burn it, we throw chemicals at it, and we cut it out. And then we take a picture in time. And in the picture in time, it says that you're cancer free. And then go back home, you're a survivor after a few years, go back to your life. I think that we've got it really, really wrong. We don't have proper follow through. And we don't have proper investigation as to what the root cause of it was. The and cause, yeah. th the problem is, is that we don't know what the root cause, but we do know what are the, what are the factors, the multifactorial part of it. We do know the factors that contributed to, to mm -hmm. it. So can we educate the patient about what the factors are? Can we test 
there's certain functional tests we can absolutely look at stuff that that complements those factors and can we follow through so even if it's a picture in time it says they're cancer free <clears throat> unfortunately a lot of these folks who are cancer free like my mom a year later it comes back much more aggressive and yep. metastatic and then the patients die unfortunately but the question is like can we avoid in that very integral time through education and through testing can we avoid the cancer ever coming back mm -hmm. and, and are there i mean i i agree with you i i mean i i have uh people close to me that that have dealt with cancer and there's almost no resources for this type of education or treatment or no. anything like that so i, I mean what have there been any kind of advancements in, in this since then i mean how can because even if people are aware of it who who do you go see to do this right well you know like when i was in my residency immunotherapy was becoming really hot and and it's great but it's still we're still coming from the point of treating the symptoms right yeah like you can t give me the most advanced advanced targeted tumor killer mm -hmm. right you can give me the, the best one beautiful you'll get rid of the symptoms yeah. but what what are you giving me long term that i know the tumor won't come back yeah actually what are we doing to the soil to make sure that it's not growing the weeds that, yeah. that's what i want to know like yeah. i don't care i don't care if you can from 100 miles away sniper point a weed growing out from the soil i don't care about that that's great but tell me what you're gonna do for the soil so what are the advancements i mean like there's integrative oncology there's a lot of naturopathic and functional uh, practitioners who work within that field. Um, I always tell people to look at ONC OnCamp, O-N-C-A-N-P dot org. Um, that is the database of naturopathic physicians who are, um, who are specializing in oncology, mm -hmm. onc, onc a and P. So, um, and then you can look for who the closest one is near you if you are, or a loved one has cancer. All right. Beautiful. Because I, I think it's really important that people actually have uh, real resources that they they can um, reach out to uh, for things like this. So so thank you for that. Um, and when it comes to to the root cause of these, what would you say are some are just a couple of the 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 main factors that that overwhelm people and and are the root cause of of cancers and things like that. Mm. Um, nutrition is part of it for sure. It's of not course, certainly yeah. it's certainly not the thing. You know, you, a, a lot of folks, you can't just have cancer. I'm not saying for everyone, but there's a lot of people who think they can get diagnosed, change their diet, and it's cured. Yeah. It's, it's, sometimes it's more complex than that. But there is the nutrition aspect. There's the inflammation, the infection aspect. There's the gut health aspect. There's the exposures to environmental toxins, which is a massive aspect that no one's looking at. Yeah. And, and so many of us, and this is why I do environmental medicine, are exposed to chemicals and heavy metals that are known to cause cancer mm -hmm. and they have it in their body at high levels so this is it's it's mind blowing to me that one of the first tests that are, that, that that that's not done is it should be like a environmental toxin panel because we know that that's a huge piece of the pie mm -hmm. there's the stress the persistent stress so when we talk about deeper stuff like you and me love the mind body connection the traumas um the forgiveness aspect like it it, it sounds more ethereal but it's it's if you think about physiologically what persistent stress does to the body mm -hmm. of unresolved trauma, that's a big problem. That's a Absolutely. big problem that fuels, that's adding fuel to the fire. Those are just some of them. I mean, like they, it, what, what are the causes, right? Like that's what, that, those are the things that we truly know about. Uh, uh, we need a robust immune system. So again, like if, if someone has cancer, they need to be addressing the whole pie. Yeah. Right. You can't just go, I'm going to eat better <laughs> and, and I'm going to start pooping better and maybe I'll check my hormones. But like, what about infections? What about inflammation? What about gut health? What about environmental toxins? What about mm -hmm. trauma? You see what I'm saying? Like, you need someone to properly draw that pie for you and start yeah. investigating systematically on each one and, and talking about it. Absolutely. I totally agree. And that, that, that's why I really wanted a resource for, for people to be able to reach out to because some people, whether it's time, and different responsibilities or finances, whatever it is. I mean, not everybody has the opportunity to um, mm -hmm. to do these things or the capability to do these things on their own. So mm -hmm. I, like, again, like we were, I was saying before, it's really important to be able to reach out and ask for help. Yep. So, um, so how important is it to have the awareness that our bodies work with the laws of nature and we are actually part of nature? It's very important. It's, it, is the, it is the key to health, to understand that 
we are co- intimately tied to the nature that we see. I just mm-hmm. had an incredible podcast with Zach Bush, and he highlighted and illum- illuminated this whole thing of showing that, like, the way the earth breathes is the way that we breathe, right? Mm-hmm. Our, our connection, like, if we want to learn about the body, be in nature more. Um, because healing truly does happen in nature. I mean, should I talk about grounding all the time? Why? Because there's evidence that it does so many things. Yep. You know, it's not just, it's not just oh, you put your feet on the ground, you're going to have less stress or your yeah. state and rhythm might be balanced. But there's so much more to grounding. Yeah. Well, what about breathing in? What about bre- ba- nature bathing, right? What Breathing in the forest, right? What does that do? Well, you're breathing in viruses, you're breathing in bacteria, you're breathing mm-hmm. in yeast and mold. And in fact, like these are things that your microbiome through the nose, through the skin, through the through the lungs, through the every single part of your body needs. Yep. Oh yeah, that's in nature, right? What about what about uh, putting your what about he- listening to nature? What does that do to the parasympathetic mm-hmm. nervous system? So we are nature, dude. You know, yeah, like exactly. Yeah. You want to learn more about your health? Go live. Go live like Dr. G in the mountains and see yeah. and, <laughs> and, and see how tied, how intimately tied you are to a tree how intimately tied you are to the dirt, how intimately tied you are to insects, everything, right? Yeah. So I think that there's levels to health and, and medicine and the way we teach. And the first level is teaching people about their body and teaching people about like, oh, well, here, this is what gut health looks like. And here's what like your respiratory system looks like and infections. The second level is teaching people about their environment, which is what I've done a lot of, like teaching what's in our what's in our home what are we breathing in what's in our work what are we breathing in what are we putting on our skin mm-hmm. but really the 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 level that we absolutely need to talk about is a communal and global health right yeah. like what we do to the world we're we're unfortunately not seeing that we're doing to our bodies yeah a hundred percent what we're taking away from our communities that connection to community is what we're doing to ourselves and it's 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 silly that we don't see that but we don't um yeah so yes, literally the health of us is the health of nature. Yeah, the, the, the way I think about it and I've described it before is we have to look at things macroscopically and microscopically to kind of see that. And, and like you said, in the soil or, or like a single celled organism, we, we are not so different from all of these other beings or, or um, parts of nature. If you, yeah. if, you, if you pull away all the layers and you break things down, we're actually pretty much exactly the same. Yeah. And then and then looking at it macroscopically, if you if you look at the universe and, and the galaxies and we are just one small piece of everything, th- th- this this cosmos that, that goes on around us. And again, it all works in, if not the same, very similar fashion. So it, it's really important, like you just said, to, to understand that we are not just separate from nature. We are part of and very much integrated with the nature that's all around us. Let me tell you something. If I was ever diagnosed with a incurable disease, incurable, because um, I don't believe any di- every disease. I don't believe diseases are incurable. I believe mm-hmm. that you can reverse anything. I would first first be away uh, in nature for about a month by myself. No one bother me. Let me get back to me. Let me be in nature as much like most of the day, literally being bathed in nature. Then I would invite or bring up a community of loved ones and be around people who truly bring me joy, who I can be authentically myself. Right. And then, and then I'd go from there. Right. I'd probably do some fasting, you know, <laughs> do, do a really nice fast, learn, le- do, do some tests. But like the first and foremost, nature would be the first intervention I would do if I was ever diagnosed with a, a very, very bad disease or, 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 or a tough disease. Yeah. Um, na- that's number one period. You know, like get myself right, get in touch with nature, be nature. Yeah. And, and then that would be my baseline. And then I go from there. Yeah, I, absolutely. Because that, that, that teaches us to go within. Yeah. And, and I, like you said, I think that's, that's of utmost importance. Um, and this kind of brings me to, to the next point that I wanted to make. And, and on one of your posts says diseases are never just physical. So I, I was going to ask you to elaborate on that. And, and I, think, I think you already have. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make it short then. I, I, it's, it is literally the tip of the iceberg. The mental, yeah. emotional, the spiritual is, is there, right? Like it, it, it's, it's interesting because I've seen patients who came to me and we've done the best test, the best diet, the best supplements. And this was early on because those how, that's how I was practicing. Mm-hmm. But we talked about the mind body. We had a little 
a few sessions but when you truly dive deep into that i don't know how much sup how much supplements you need when yeah. you heal and release that trauma right yeah. when you forgive when you see who you truly authentically are face to face mm -hmm. and you go well, damn, I've been this most beautiful, high vibration person all my life. And I've been told by people that I'm not, or I've told myself that I'm not. And when you come to face to face with who you are, the most beautiful person in the goddamn world, that is the most powerful thing because you will, you can heal anything when you truly remember who you are. And this is yeah. the, what I try to bring people. That's what's under the water of the glacier, like yeah. the mental, <laughs> emotional. And then on top of that, all of a sudden, you're, you're liberated and you go, oh, shoot, my stomach doesn't hurt anymore. What was happening there? Oh, my God, mm -hmm. that ache in my back went away. I mean, masters over millennia have taught this, right? Yeah. Like addressing that deeper part of you is the most powerful thing that you can do for your health. Then Absolutely. you address the physical, right? But physical should never be here's all $100 worth of supplements, you know, and, and do all these things for your body, which is beautiful. But forget about all the other deeper stuff. There's so much deeper stuff. Yeah, so I mean, what, really what, what we're talking about here, I think, is what you've talked about many times before is the innate, <laughs> the body's innate ability to heal. Um, how, how do we begin to further tap into this sort of medicine healing process, though? Remove the obstacles to healing mm -hmm. and give the body what it needs to heal. That's how you tap into it. The body is always looking for a, a place of homeostasis. We know that through our teach to our schooling you know we learn what homeostasis is mm -hmm. and can you see me or did i go dark here it went it went a little dark <laughs> i don't know what happened okay there you go you see me right yeah there you go uh went a little dark again but there we go now it's better okay sorry guys no, um, no so we know about homeostasis mm -hmm. we know that the body is always looking for balance you get a cut it learns how to you know it it seamlessly and elegantly can heal it and it's a beautiful thing but we don't mm -hmm. think about it well the same yeah. thing happens every single day all day in your body your body looks for balance so what blocks the body from truly healing is not giving the body what it needs whether it's nutritionally whether it's sleep whether it's fasting whether it's nature giving the body what it needs and removing the obstacles to healing well whether that's self-sabotaging behaviors eating like crap uh trauma not forgiving letting go those are things that block that healing. So again, you got to put, it's like a little equation. You got to put in the pluses and you got to take out the minuses yeah, to, yeah. to realize true healing. And, and the more minuses you take out, the more pluses you put in, the more powerful the healing is. So Absolutely. that's how you just have, you work with the body. That's what every mm -hmm. doctor in the world should be doing. We shouldn't be <laughs> trying to work against the body and suppress symptoms. It's wild. Why would you suppress a fever? The body's working to mount a fever you work yeah. with the body within a safe range. <laughs> yeah. See what I'm saying? I, I completely agree. Uh, my mom's an ICU nurse since before I was born. So, I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about. Perfect. Um, so uh, another topic that, that not very many people understand and um, is obviously way more complex than what we're going to get into it now. But I, I, I'd like people to ha have a little bit of a better understanding of what epigenetics is and, and how important it is the, to have the awareness of, of what this is for our health. Yeah, epigenetics is, is the, the fact, because it does happen, is that there are outside factors like diet or, or stress or thoughts that have an effect on your genetic makeup. They activate certain parts of the gene that, that expresses differently. So epigenetic means that, okay, if I have a family history of cancer, that doesn't mean I'm going to get cancer. What it does mean is my predisposition is there. And through life, my decisions, right, the things that I've put in my body, the things that I've exposed myself to can express that cancer. Or I can really be vigilant about what's going in my body, what, I'm, what, what my thoughts are, um, what I'm exposed to, really doing the best that I can. And it can express something differently. So it's basically the, the, how, how genes can go one way or another and the power that we have over it. It's pretty wild, but yeah, epigenetics, you know, we have blue eyes, that's, that's, that's not epigenetics. We have brown <laughs> eyes, that's not epigenetics. Yeah. But the expression of cancer is an epigenetic concept. So uh, just because you have a family member who has it doesn't mean that you're gonna get it. Yeah, it's more about the, the, the flexible portion of our genetic code. Mm -hmm. um, and and so, so what are some of the ways that, um, that, that, that you've seen this be influenced with patients or, or 
other people that you've met? I mean, again, like the mind body part is, is massive, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you, if, if your epigenetics, if your genetic expression is being influenced by persistent stress, then it stands to believe when you remove that stress that you can completely experience a different genetic expression and thus have a reversal of disease, for example. So I've had many patients, many patients when we address the mind-body aspect of their health, um, completely change their symptoms, completely change their capacity to heal their faster. So um, I think I think the stress portion of epigenetics is is one of the most major things that needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Of course, the diet, but like everyone here, like knows about vegetables, and and it's it's nice to talk about vegetables. But there's more about this. I know I see my friend Johnny Juicer joined in, and um, much love to you. Um, I was I was yeah. referring a lot to um, you know trauma, and and he's one of the people that I referred to on this on this. So much love to him and support for um, for the passing of his mom. Yeah, absolutely. I, I complete, I'm there with you, but much love to that. And, um, definitely sending you condolences and, um, I appreciate, um, what you guys do and, and that connection and how you guys work together. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so, so stress is, is an, an important factor. What, what are some of the, the things that you would say people can do right now to, to actually reduce the amount of stress that they have, especially with, with the way things are right now in our society, because stress is, I mean, running rapid everywhere. Go to nature, man. Like that's it. We just, we just said it. Like if you are, tell me, tell me the person that can go on a hike and go, okay, I'm so pissed off still at my coworker. Like <laughs> tell me the person <laughs> who can go to the beach and be like, I hate my ex-girlfriend so much, you know, like if, if, if you want to reduce your stress and you can't, and like, you don't have time for meditation, you don't have time to yoga, then make time to go outside, make time to be in nature, make time to be bathing in the forest, make time to be away from everything, make time for your thoughts, make time for forgiveness. Like what, everything you ever needed, your answers are right here. You know, this yeah. is why, this is why I live in the mountains. Like I'm outside all day. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm the healthiest I've ever been mentally, emotionally, and physically. Is that a coincidence or is it, or is there something deeper happening within nature? Is there an energetic change? I mean, we know Japanese businessmen will walk on their, on their lunch break and they'll have a change in their physiology. They'll have an increase mm -hmm. in antioxidants, a reduction in inflammation. Yeah. That's, that's literally just breathing in the forest. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it would just be silly to like spend all this money to try to reduce your stress when when all you need to do is really go outside put your feet on the ground and breathe yeah yeah that, that's beautiful i actually do that during my lunch breaks <laughs> at the office it, it's, I love not, that. it's not in the, it's not in the forest but <laughs> it it's outside in nature and there's trees and there's animals it, and um and, and i can definitely say that it, it is absolutely true and it, it absolutely does work in it and it definitely kind of reconfigures the rest of the day um, I remember I had this patient um, early on in my career and she was a young girl. I think she was like 32 years old and she had depression and she was on all these medications. And, you know, I was doing all of this testing and neurotransmitters and putting her in a protocol and diet. And I forgot early on to just say, like, why don't you go on a walk? Why don't you start doing all of these you know, like I was so focused on like the functional part of medicine mm -hmm. that I forgot what like the art of medicine looked like. Yeah. And she took it upon herself, thank God, to start walking around her neighborhood every morning for 40 minutes without fail. And I, all of a sudden, I hear from her three months later, and she's like, oh, Dr. G, I'm not depressed anymore. I was like, great, the, the supplements work. She's like, yeah, they work, but I'm also walking every day. I was yeah. like, I was like well, damn, uh, why, didn't I, why didn't I recommend that? <laughs> and uh, ever since then, I was like, maybe there's something really powerful outside of these awesome supplements that I think I'm giving you. So, um yeah, yeah, they, like that. That would be the thing to do. Yeah, and and I also want to make a point. To, it's when when people do this, um, like you were saying, when like who can be upset about a coworker or an ex or whatever when they're at the beach or or going for a walk in nature. You have to really be going for that walk, though. You have to be present and mindful mm -hmm. in that moment, not on your phone, not doing a million other different things. Good point. I mean, Good it's point. Really important to be present with what you're doing. Yeah, and you and you know what? Like for me, as much as I love music and I listen to music all day, like in those times, there's no music, no music yeah. allowed. Like you got to let that silence be there. No stimulus, no, no output coming inside, right? Like you want to be completely focused. So you have to go on that walk. Like you said, you know, 100%. like allow, like, can you be mindful on your walk? 
Mm-hmm. Remember, like listening, smelling, hearing. If you're if you're consistently coming back, like, oh, I'm distracted. Oh, I'm back to being mindful. I'm distracted. I'm back to being mindful. If you can practice that every single time you go on a walk, that's true. That's where the healing happens. Yeah. It doesn't ha- it doesn't happen when you're going on a walk and listening to your walk playlist, which might yeah. be a great playlist, but yeah. <laughs> it's not the time for healing. You know, a hundred percent. It's it's like building a muscle. I mean, and and every time we kind, our our mind kind of wanders, it's that bringing back to to the moment. That's the that's like doing a rep. Exactly. Exactly. Mr. Mindful Doctor, I have a podcast to do soon, so I'm going to have to go. Yes, we're we're going we're ending in not even, in less than 5 minutes. So perfect. Um I I I am actually um going to start wrapping up right now, so that that's perfect timing. Um in closing, um I, I would I want to know if you could if there were only 3 things that you could share with people to start implementing in their lives immediately to improve their health. What would they be? Um wake up every single morning. And take your time for yourself, whether it's 15 minutes or whether it's uh, four hours, take that time to yourself and allow space for reflection. So like you said, it's a, it's a muscle, uh, but we may not see it. But when we develop that ability to be alone, well, even if you have kids, be alone in the shower. Right. Mm-hmm. For 15 minutes, just be alone and be and start speaking affirmations, start speaking gratitude, start looking at the person that you're creating. Right. And this is one of the most important things I can say. If you're not taking an audit of who you are, then you're living life on autopilot and life ain't fun. Life ain't fun on autopilot because mm-hmm. shit, shit just happens to you. Mm-hmm. Right. But when you truly say, am I the man that I want to create? Am I a man of, for me, for example, intention or integrity or, you know, speaking my truth without fear? Like all these things, take that audit on yourself every single day and see the person you create because you can construct and deconstruct your person your avatar very fast oh like yeah in in a day you know mm-hmm. i can be i can be like the biggest dickhead in america tomorrow <laughs> if i want yeah. and, and guess what the universe will give me reasons more reasons to be that they'll give me yeah. people who enjoy being yelled at you know take that time all right what else nature i just said it a thousand times yeah. put your feet on the ground breathe in nature try to do those some of those rituals outside in nature if you live in a concrete jungle go to the nearest park if you can you know and community you have to have community this is literally the three things i'm telling you are the three first interventions that you do for health Mm -hmm. which rituals allow time and space for yourself be in nature and find community if you're not with a community then i then you're not truly putting yourself in a place to be your healthiest you have to be in a community of people that are supportive people you can truly be yourself around authentically you you can be loving of yourself and 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 them and they're like-minded so the vibration is there they're influential they're inspirational not people that are anchors like um there was i have a friend who says are they an elixir or, or are they a poison Period. Mm-hmm. Like, yes or no? Is this person in front of me an elixir or a poison? If they're a poison, goodbye. I don't care if I've known you for 20 years. If you're a poison in my life, you're out. Yeah. If, you're, if you're an elixir, then you're influential. Then you're inspirational. Then I want to be around you. I can be my most authentic self around you. And I got love for you. Those are the type of people. That's your community. If you yeah. have that community, then tell, tell me how sick someone can be when, they, when they're loved by a community and they love themselves. When they're in nature and they have rituals. I don't know how sick someone can be. But for me, I would venture to say that, they, they, that a lot of the issues that they have would be completely wiped out. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I practice all three of these things. And, and I, can only, um, uh, in, I can only repeat what you just said to, to get that across to people. That how important these things are. Especially the community. When, how, about how that, that energy and of that of like-minded individuals be it, it is it creates an infinite amount of, of positivity in your life and i mean we're communal beings so that, that's biologically sound and i mean it it's very well known so i what well, thank wh- you for that Go yeah ahead. yeah yeah really quick somebody mentioned what about god it, in your rituals when you allow space for yourself you find your god yes. whatever whatever your religion is you find your god and you you're face to face and you go mm-hmm. Well, holy shit, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen because yeah. <laughs> you, you, you realize how beautiful you are. So it doesn't matter your religion. Do your rituals, allow your space, allow solitude, allow yourself to look at yourself, go deep in meditation, go deep in yoga, go deep in mindfulness. You find your God, whatever it is. Yes. And, and I, I appreciate all the questions everybody's asking here, guys. This is so beautiful. And um, we, we are going to start wrapping this up because we do 
get cut off at an hour. And uh, Dr. G said he's got to go. Um, I sure do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we got so, we got a really fiery podcast coming up. It's going to be amazing. Awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing it. And um, so go ahead and watch uh, watch this episode again. It will be on my YouTube channel, guys. It will be on my, my um, Instagram page as well if you missed anything. Um, feel free to reach out to either of us about the questions that you have. Um, a quick recap for for Dr. Gonzalez here. I mean, the, the podcast that we're talking about is called Heal Thyself. I definitely suggest you guys go check it out um, on his Instagram and on other sources of social media. It's at mm -hmm. Dr. Gonzalez. Um, and as always, everybody, I welcome your comments, feedback, suggestions. Um, I appreciate you all taking your time on, on a Thursday afternoon to to come on here and and spend your time your time with us. Um, you can check out all previous episodes of the show, The Art of Mindful Medicine, on my YouTube channel. Um, you can also check it out on my website, www.mindful.doctor. Um, and of course, we are on Instagram Live, and I will always announce the new episodes um, at least a few days before for you guys to come on and watch in and see who the next guest is going to be so we can um, continue sharing more knowledge and creating more of this community because, again, that's what this is really about, connecting people with other people and, then, and sharing knowledge and, and creating that love that, that we all have within us. So... Um, as always, I'd like to end with a quote, and this is from Jiddu um, Krishnamurti, and it says, it is no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So, everybody, thank you once again. Um, Christian, thank you once again. I'm, I really, really appreciate you coming on here, my man. I really look forward to, to staying in touch with you and connecting again in the future. Um, all the best with what you're doing out there and, and have fun in the mountains and in nature and um, have an awesome podcast, dude. Thank, thank you, brother. All right. I appreciate you all. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Absolutely. Have a good one, my man. Okay. Bye.